This is Matthew Cratters, Bitcoin University. Today, I want to talk about how I got frozen inside of Bitcoin forever. So spoiler alert, I've been frozen inside of the Bitcoin blockchain for all eternity and not in a very nice way that I would like to be remembered for. But first, some necessary background. You'll notice how all of the dirtiest attacks come from the Bitcoin core supporter side of things. The endless gaslighting, the dripping condescension, calling your concerns pleb slop. We've been seeing a lot of that on Twitter recently. The arrogance telling you that your node doesn't matter because you're not rich. In other words, it's not an economic node, which itself is a false critique. And also DDoSing regular Bitcoin knots, node supporters and runners in their homes and laughing about it as we saw Shinobi and Wicked and Rob Hamilton laughing about here. Let's play the video. <laughs> Because they have a date, because Comcast one. users, because we have a list of basically knots nodes that advertise them knots, and then they, the, the users of Comcast. So basically, they're attacking Bitcoin node runners who run knots from their homes and happen to be on Comcast. There's also been a lot of really nasty stuff put on the Bitcoin blockchain about various Bitcoin knot supporters. There's always a risk, of course, to drawing attention to this stuff, the Streisand effect. So I'm only going to show you what they've done to me. I don't want to bring other people into this. But trust me when I tell you that they've been doing the same thing to other Bitcoiners who've been leading the charge against the nepotism, the corruption, and the stupidity of Bitcoin Core. What follows will also offer interesting insights into the risks of allowing large blobs of data in Bitcoin op returns. We're actually going to be looking at some op returns. We're going to be looking at a block, for example, here that was mined 27 days ago by F2 pool. And if we take a look in one of the op returns, we can see it says here, Bitcoin University founder, Matt Cratter. My Twitter link, Twitter handle is a scammer and a pervert. And then they've linked to my Noster account. So this is not what you want to see. I want to state for the record, obviously, that I'm neither a pervert nor a scammer of any sort. I'm a faithful family man with wonderful children. And I've actually spent years on this channel not scamming people, but rather shining a light on scams. Ship coins like Ethereum and Cardano and Hex. You guys have been along for this journey, many of you. Corporate scams like Celsius, BlockFi, Voyager, FTX, all these companies that were being pushed by other influencers and that ended up blowing up during the previous bear market. And then scams on Bitcoin, really this cycle like ordinals, inscriptions, BRC20 tokens. But I wanted to use this opportunity to take a closer look at this op return because I think it's pretty educational, even though it's saying very nasty things about me. It was mined by F2 pool, which is significant. F2 pool currently controlling about 11% of all blocks that are mined. And as Luke Dasher points out here, F2 pool is actively attacking the network right now. And they've been one of the groups, one of the mining pools that's been running uh, Bitcoin Core 30 and mining large op returns. But it's interesting to see here how filters do still work in terms of providing frictions to getting transactions like this confirmed, because as we're going to see, this is a large op return. This is not a transaction that would be re relayed by normal nodes. And so it needed to be submitted directly. It looks to me, my guess would be whoever submitted this, probably a Bitcoin Core supporter, submitted it using Peter Todd's Libra Relay, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the reason I say that is because right here it says not seen in mempool. So it didn't really circulate probably through the P2P network. This is also a non-standard transaction. It's non-standard. It's a non-standard op return because it's more than 80 or 83 bytes. But we can see the frictions involved here. You could not send it across the regular network. You had to submit it directly to a miner using Libra Relay, and they ended up overpaying in terms of fees, overpaying by 2x. They paid 6 sats per v-byte, when, when at the time you could have paid 3 sats per v-byte. So these are the frictions. This is how filters work work. And this was obviously mined before Bitcoin Core 30. Uh, but filters do work to the extent that they force you to pay more and they force you to perhaps go directly. So let's take a look at this op return exactly. We can see that it's we have an input on the left and then we have two outputs on the right. One of them contains actual sats. Op returns are unspendable. They're prunable from the UTXO set. And the fact that you can prune them from the UTXO spent demonstrates that they can never be spent. So if you put any sats, if you put any money, in one of these op return outputs, you will end up uh, never being able to get that money back or never being able to spend it, even if you control the keys for that address. So we can see this person was smart. They didn't put any money in op returns. And normally people will not do that. 
the virtual size of this upper turn, call it 255 V bytes. We're going to take a look at that and corroborate it. But if we click here on details, and again, now that it's Bitcoin Core 30, there could be some nasty stuff being put on chain. So I'd be very careful looking inside of upper turns. It's not something uh, you maybe want to do all the time. But this one I know is about me. So I can go in here and here's the actual upper out, turn output, zero, uh, zero sats here, zero Bitcoin. And we can see here the output turn data that I'm a scammer and a pervert, etc. But here's how it's actually encoded. So we can take this, we can copy it, and then we can paste it in here as a in this byte counter. I believe I've done this correctly. This says it's 264 bytes. So I don't know what I'm missing here. Maybe someone who's more technical can tell me because it says um, that right here it says this is 264 bytes, whereas here it said there's 255. Uh, bytes. But either way, the important thing to recognize here is this is a large op return that certainly, whether it's 264 or 255 bytes, is greater than the 83 bytes, which would be relayed by the network. And this is why the person had to use Libra Relay and submit it, uh, submit it directly to a pool that was mining large op returns like F2 pool. So that's how you look inside of an op return. Libra Relay is really basically a modification of Bitcoin Core software that I believe just gets rid of the mempool and allows you to connect directly to scammy mining pools like F2 pool that will mine you large op returns. This was invented, of course, created by Peter Todd, who's been on the other side of the spam war. So I couldn't resist uh, playing this because this is what uh, most people think of him at this point. So let's generalize this now. Now let's say that instead of making a mean op return about me, let's say that someone did the same thing about the Prophet Muhammad, embedding a large high fidelity 100,000 byte sacrilegious cartoon of him in an op return. What do you think would happen next? Perhaps something like this, perhaps not, but we've certainly seen things like this in the past. And look, I'm not a Muslim, but I also don't like to go around trashing other people's religions, especially unnecessarily and inadvertently just because I want to run a Bitcoin node. And when I signed up to use Bitcoin as money in, 20, in 2019, I did not sign up to distribute large images like this. This was nowhere on anyone's radar because Bitcoin's obviously a monetary network. That's why we all came to Bitcoin. And these large images do absolutely nothing. These large op returns do absolutely nothing to make Bitcoin better money. They're all downside and no upside, as we've seen with the example with me and the Prophet Muhammad. Again, I don't care if the CIA pays Al Qaeda using Bitcoin or someone uses Bitcoin to buy fentanyl or pay for someone's murder. I'm 100% against these actions, of course, but I'm willing to keep a record of those pseudonymous monetary transactions. I'm willing to host a monetary ledger, in other words, the blockchain on my computer or on my node because I need to store the history of your monetary transactions if I want you to store the history of my monetary transactions. I'm okay with people using Bitcoin to do whatever they want, just as criminals use US dollars to do really bad stuff every day. And you, sh you shouldn't get them through their money flows, you should get them for the actual crimes that they commit. So I'm against surveillance, of course. But what I never did when I signed up to use Bitcoin was to sign up to relay offensive non-monetary data around the world. There's a place for that as a form of political protest and subversion, of course, but Bitcoin is a really poor tool for doing this. And if you want to do this, you should just use something like BitTorrent instead if you want to send arbitrary data around the world. Now do you see why allowing large blobs of non-monetary data in a place like Opperturn, which is specifically and officially reserved for non-arbitrary data by the reference implementation by Bitcoin Core in its documentation, and has been for over a decade, so we have this precedent, now do you see why this is a really, really bad idea? Idea. I think Nick Szabo says it quite well in this post. He writes, arbitrary content on blockchains makes them far, far more risky legally and morally to operate than with blockchains confined to financial transactions. Running a node where one cannot selectively delete unacceptable content without wider functional disruption is also far riskier than running data services where one can selectively delete unacceptable content without causing wider functional disruption. And this is why it's important to intercept a CSAM block before it gets buried too deep, too, too deeply in the chain. Nick goes on to write, there are a wide variety of moral and legal categories of arbitrary content, and many of them are radically different from each other, CSAM slash CP, other kinds of obscenity, copyrighted material, censored political content, trade secrets, classified material, and many other such categories are treated in extremely different ways from each other by morality and by law. 
What's more, each of the hundreds of jurisdictions over which a blockchain runs has its own wide variations. Some legal prohibitions, such as those against CSAM, CP, have extremely high popularity and involve highly motivated enforcement. Government response to one kind of content is an extremely poor predictor of its response to another kind of content. The response of one government to a kind of content is often a poor predictor of a response to another government to the same content. Nodes on blockchains that, through means such as escalating fee schedules, by limits, format enforcement, etc., and filters, which is part of format enforcement, discourage arbitrary content, are far less risky. These kind of blockchains are far less risky to run than nodes on blockchains that encourage arbitrary content. And this is the huge change that I've been trying to make people understand that Bitcoin Core has done. They've turned the Bitcoin blockchain into the latter category when it used to be the former category, and these risks weren't involved. Good summary from Nick, arbitrary content makes Bitcoin's threat environment far larger, far less predictable, and in some cases far more highly motivated. And again, we're not trying to suck up to governments. We've been accused of that, but no one would accuse Nick Salvo of being a government bootlegger, at least I hope not. We're just trying to avoid committing unforced errors that unnecessarily put actual Bitcoiners into legal and moral risk by trying to turn Bitcoin into something that it was never intended to be. These people want to turn it into free cloud storage for the world's criminals and perverts. That is how it's going to end up. Call me crazy, but I like to be able to run a Bitcoin node at home without having to also host CSAM that's stored in a place that's been designated by Bitcoin Core itself as the best place to stash your arbitrary data, namely Opperturn. I wanted to finish with another Opperturn that was about me, also mined by F2 Pool. Also, they had to pay double the fee rate to get this block mined, this transaction mined. This was again submitted probably using Libra Relay because it wasn't seen in the mempool. And again, it's a large uh, a large non-standard opportune, so it's greater than 83 bytes. This one is pretty funny. It says, do not spend $790 for Matthew Cratter's Plebslop Bitcoin trading courses. It's a scam, and then it has links uh, to me again. If we take a look at the details here, we can see again, it's a large uh, it's a large op return. It's bigger than 83 bytes. This one says it's 287, uh, 287 bytes. But I thought I'd take this opportunity just because I, I don't normally talk about it. In fact, I should be promoting it a lot more than I do. But I do have this site called Bitcoin University where I have live classes, recordings of live classes, a private forum, and a Bitcoin course. In spite of what it says here, this is not a Bitcoin trading course. This is more about how to hold your Bitcoin, how to do cold storage and multi-sig, how to buy non-KYC Bitcoin, how to do coin joins, and lots of advanced techniques, but we never advocate for trading. That was my previous business, which was Trader University, but I've never traded, uh, I've never traded Bitcoin since 2019. So if you want to get access, and again, they say it's to $790 for a trading course. This is not, this is not correct. It's $79 per month. You can buy the annual plan, which you'll get 12 months for the price of 10 months. That's what costs $790. Uh, but I think for the content that's involved here, this is a very reasonable, very reasonable price, sixty uh, seventy nine dollars. And if you pay using Bitcoin, and you can use a, um, a burner email address for this. If you pay using Bitcoin, uh, it's only sixty nine dollars. The email address is only required, so I can send you your username, and then you can set up a password. But there's uh, you certainly don't have to. You can do this in a more non KYC manner. If you subscribe to Bitcoin University Premium, you'll get access to all the live classes, which I do one live class every month and then i also record them so you can see there's a huge library here a guide to ultimate guide to bitcoin loans how to use cold card and nunchuck uh, passphrase wallets how to do home mining with ocean datum and bitax i've done a, a video about that on the channel as well but this goes a little bit more in depth and then i recently did um i recently did a live class on soft forks and hard forks uh, pay join UTXO management and a bunch of these other things so you get access to these live classes and the recordings you also get ad, uh, access to the, uh, the to the main course here and you get access to the Bitcoin forum so I will use this opportunity this being put into opportunity to do a little plug for myself which I don't do too often on this channel uh, but I thought again you know these people are liars just the way they flames they uh, frame stuff as well it's just not not true if you enjoyed this video be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when i publish my next video let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below I'll also put a link to all of this in case you want to subscribe to bitcoin university i'll put a link in the description notes below thanks a lot for watching and i'll see you in the next video